Um, John Douglas, who's a very well-known crime profiler, uh, said he believes that someone that was either angry at me or jealous of me. And uh, I thought, well, I, I can't imagine I've made anybody angry. Uh, and, Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. This is the last episode in the 23 Years Ago Today John Bonet series. Um, we'll be looking at the lawsuit and also briefly looking at the implications of the last photo. Before we get to that, um, I just want to refer to the clip that I played at the beginning of this episode where you hear John Ramsey talking about John Douglas the world-renowned FBI profiler that he sort of brought in on, in, in on the case. Um, John Douglas uh, met John Ramsey on the 9th of, of January 1997, one day after Burke's interview with Dr. Susan Bernhard, which is quite interesting. Burke was never introduced to Douglas um, and um, but what is interesting in this clip is how John kind of almost like contradicts Team Ramsey in a way in the sense that he says that his expert said that the profile of the killer uh, kind of had a, um, a grudge or kind of a, a chip on his shoulder um, you know, in terms of John Ramsey, and I, I think that's true. I think he did. Um, and and then John says, "I can't imagine I've made anybody angry." But you know, if you just take those words, um, you know, I can't imagine. And you. link it to the ransom note and the ransom note indicates someone who it's a contrivance of course the ransom notes not real but it in indicates a contrivance a an imagined scenario where someone is angry with John Ramsey and it's addressed to John Ramsey so John Ramsey saying I can't imagine I've made anybody angry well Someone did imagine that. Whoever wrote the ransom note imagined that someone was angry with John. A foreign faction. A disgruntled employee. And the Ramses themselves, when they were asked by the police, you know, you know, who 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 could be you know, who could it be? And they said, Well, they think it's an inside job. But, you know, more to the merits of the question, just like in a general sense, when he says, you know, I can't imagine I've made anybody angry. Well, if you go to John Ramsey's Wikipedia page, it just lists one defamation suit after another. It's against St. Martin's Press, Time, the Fox News Channel, American Media, The Star, The Globe, Court TV, and the New York Post. That's that's eight separate lawsuits. So so you telling me, um, you know, like this is in the aftermath of the murder. Um, you got eight separate civil suits kind of going on, and you're telling me this is a guy who can't make other people angry, or doesn't get angry because of what somebody else does. You know, one can go into more detail about this. There was kind of a scuffle with his son John, John Andrew, with a with a reporter. I'm not going to go into that here, but I'm just saying this, this whole idea that um, you know, can, can anybody say that? Like, can anybody sort of say, you know, I, I don't think I've made anybody angry in my whole life. 
and you know if you're a CEO with hundreds of employees you've got an ex-wife you've got kind of an extended family of children and other things um, you've, ha you've had an affair with someone um, it just sort of puts that all comment into kind of perspective and you know one of the housekeepers spoke about when you know John came home from a trip and the bathroom was flooded in fact the whole house was flooded something I mentioned in Christmas Star just this incident and um, you know in a way I kind of give John some credit there the fact that there was twenty thousand dollars of damage and John kind of appeared angry I would have I would be pretty angry myself if, if I had that kind of damage I would just not be in a good mood but what the housekeeper said is she said you could see you could see it kind of in his face and the, what's quite interesting here is he doesn't necessarily express anger the way someone else would it seems he seems to be kind of an introvert and someone who keeps th that um, those feelings secret which in a way makes them um, possibly worse you know it's not necessarily going to be what you see is what you get but the interesting thing with this Wikipedia page is that it doesn't even mention the lawsuit John Ramsey lodged against CBS I mean this section is listing all the lawsuits but it simply doesn't mention the the one against CBS which is the most recent one what's also interesting is in their book you know they wrote a book and then people sued them for defamation um, so there has been a heck of a lot of enmity and strife and trauma and unhappiness if not downright misery um, around this this um, this particular case people have lost their jobs lost their livelihoods some of them have lost their reputations um, a lot of the detectives have I involved in this case have kind of broken themselves on the anvil of this kind of unyielding unrelenting case I mean Lou Smith was investigating this case until his death um, Steve Thomas resigned and I think became a carpenter um, Cola you know kind of beat his head against the wall trying to get what he was trying to you know achieve you know what I've always found very ironic and strange and just peculiar is if you accept what the grand jury decided that there was no intruder that the note was written by one of the Ramses the ransom note then if that's true if the ransom note um, is a contrivance then the amount that they are saying John Bonet's life is worth even in this fiction is only $118,000 I mean it's John's bonus they're basically saying in within this um, this ruse that they're saying that their daughter's life is worth $118 right but then when somebody says something about them that they don't like and they go after them then they think the damage to their reputation is worth 25 million or 150 million or 750 million so in other words John Bonet's life is worth $118,000 in, in their spiel, in this spiel, in the ransom note spiel. But in, when the Ramses defend their reputation, then that's worth millions, millions, untold millions of, of dollars. So we're going to deal with that uh, in a little bit more detail in this episode. We're also going to be looking at the... Um, plans and some of the books that are on the slate 
on the conveyor belt uh, for 2020. Um, some exciting developments happening this year for true crime rocket science and in true crime uh, in general. Um, so if you want to keep up to date with that sort of stuff, um, please subscribe to this channel, like, share, leave a comment. And then also look off, uh, look out for um, the debunking of the killing of John Bonet, um, the Final Suspects podcast. There, there's some really silly stuff in that particular podcast, which which I'm going to be looking at. And then some kind of heavier stuff, heavy heavy duty stuff um, that I'm going to be dealing with um, on Patreon. Um, such as the cause of death. Um, this is a very simple thing and yet it's really misunderstood. Um, I've just been um, attacked and uh, bullied and I'm not sure what all on Reddit by people who think that they're absolute experts. Uh, may, they may have been studying the case for 20 years. They, they still don't have a clue what's going on. Um, that they, If you have to ask them, um, you know, what's the cause of death they don't know they think they know but they don't know um, if you ask them what's the murder weapon such a simple question what actually caused John Bonet's death they don't know they think they know which is why um, a lot of people just don't ever figure this case out because they're so confident that they know everything um, and they're so confident that they also kick someone who's written 10 books off the forum. Um, that's, I don't know if that's confidence or arrogance, but uh, yeah, it's, um, it's interesting, that's for sure. And I mean, this little episode is just a little, a little glimpse at, at what's been happening in the John Bonet thing all along, which is, um, nobody knows what reality is so reality shifts and reality is conjured and um, it, all sorts of different people are coming from different angles saying you know I've got I've got the bigger claim to the truth you know I'm, I'm the better expert I'm the I'm the better authority believe me trust me right and we're gonna deal with that <laughs> we're gonna look at the incredible amount of theories and so on around this case that that happened you know that, that sort of exploded when the case wasn't concluded so you know if you if you're interested in some of this deeper darker analysis um, I'll be covering that on patreon um, there's not going to be too much more analysis on John Bonet after this episode on this channel, but you can head on over to Patreon for for kind of a deeper dive. Okay, so let's get started with this episode um, on the lawsuit and the last photo. Um, where we sort of ended the previous episode was basically just with Alex Hunter kind of, um, you know, um, not signing the indictments right that was kind of where it ended off and the media then reported that the grand jury hadn't voted to indict the Ramses right so it wasn't just that um, the district attorney said there's insufficient evidence what was sort of reported in the media what was assumed by that was that the grand jurors looked at the um, evidence and said there's not enough evidence to indict. And so what was implied there was that the grand jurors had thought this when it was actually they didn't think this, they thought there was enough evidence, which is why they voted for four indictments, two apiece for, for each of the Ramses. And so what it actually boiled down to was it was um, Alex Hunter overruling them. It was Alex Hunter um, deciding that he disagreed with the grand jurors and that he was going to shut down the whole thing, right? And 
this is the part which kind of gets interesting is you say well the media um, starts saying that the, the, the grand jury didn't um, vote to indict the Ramses because there was insufficient evidence but that's not true and then Alex Hunter doesn't um, correct them he doesn't say no that's actually not true um, I can't tell you what is true but um, that's not true in other words he allows this fiction to be perpetrated and and this is kind of a situation of um, four collie birds um, and four calling birds it's um, it's a slight distortion from the perspective of Alex Hunter it's sort of being a little bit economical with information right maybe very economical with information you, but you can say you know it's not much of a difference between four collie birds and four calling birds you know what's the difference between blackbirds and mockingbirds right they're birds but it's a huge difference if you're the Ramses. If you're the Ramses and you um, are being charged with accessory to murder and child abuse, those charges are there and, and you might have to stand trial for them. And then someone says, oh no, don't worry, you don't need to stand trial for them. That's a massive difference. That's the difference between five golden rings and five running hairs. It's a big difference from that respect. But if you, Alex Hunter, the difference is just semantics. I'm just saying it depends on your perspective what the difference is. And the perspective with the public also kind of changes, which is you now go from someone inside the house committed this crime and, and maybe some bodies inside the house covered it up to an intruder did everything. So just in terms of that, it's also not um, uh, blackbirds and mockingbirds. It's now um, golden rings and running hairs. You've now created a completely different scenario, right? But the part that I want to focus on here, and this is really the bottom line, is you have the grand jury um, theater, right? You have the secret result of that um, grand jury trial you know withheld from the public public don't know what's going on and so the wool is pulled over everyone's eyes right but make no mistake um, do, do you think um, the people at the center of this wouldn't have known about those indictments do you think with their lawyers, you know, the most connected and powerful in Colorado, do you think they wouldn't know the result of the grand jury trial, or, you know, which is ultimately decided but not uh, approved of? And so you jump from there to 2013 when they actually came out, you know, when these indictments were released to the media. And what's then really interesting is the response of the Ramses. Are they shocked? Is it news to them? What's going on? Um, and so what we get from Reuters is John Ramsey saying that he's opposed to the release of the court papers. Yes, I'm sure. And he's saying that if the unsigned indictments are made public they should include the entire grand jury record for context and so interestingly what Lynn Wood says here is that is sort of spinning things in uh, in a way that that makes things look like it's this, this is no big deal he, he says it's also extremely important that one keep in mind that the document to be released is a mere snippet of the case that may be of historical interest but does not take into account the conclusive dna testing in 2008 which led to the bowl the the public exoneration of the ramsey family by 
the district attorney. Now, there's so much wrong with that statement, it's not funny. Um, first of all, to say that the indictments are snippets, um, it's a little bit like saying the book of Revelations at the end of the Bible is a snippet of the Bible. You know, it's what everything boils down to. You know, the whole jury trial comes down to these indictments. That's the bottom line of the jury trial. That's what it's all about. That's what, what it um, sort of culminates in. So, so to reduce it to a snippet um, is, is a bit misleading. You know, when he says um, the document to be released is a mere snippet, um, isn't it documents? I mean, it's not... One could say that... Well, I, I don't know. Like, I, I would say that if they're four true bills, you know, if they're four indictments, then then that's documents, that, that's four pages, four pages of of accusations. That's not a snippet, but it's one page, one accusation, one paragraph. You could maybe say, you could, you could refer to that amount of text as a snippet, but it, that even that would be kind of inappropriate. How can you reduce a charge of child abuse to a snippet Mo times two you know uh, both parents were, were charged how can you reduce a charge of accessory to murder to saying calling it a snippet calling it a mere snippet it's just a it's a nothing and then he even calls it that it's, it's, it's of historical interest no it's not of historical interest it's of legal import very different and so within this sort of minimizing thing where he says you know let's keep it in context it's just a snippet that's of historical interest because it doesn't take into account something else and here he refers to this conclusive DNA testing well this DNA testing wasn't part of the grand jury trial you can't come afterwards and say well this trumps the grand jury trial I know that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to say that the DNA trumps all. I don't think it does. I don't think this is a DNA case. I don't think you can make the, 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 the claim that DNA um, sort of makes or breaks this case. There's some cases where it can. It's not, this isn't one of them. And ironically, I don't really accept the... Um, the law enforcement version here and I also don't in, I don't accept the, the Ramsey's version I don't accept that the DNA found and this is quite interesting is that, that there was DNA found on the inside of John Bonet's panties which which is quite difficult to get into right um, I'm not I've got to admit here I'm not an expert on the DNA um, uh, it's, it is quite complicated and I have dealt with it probably years ago so, so um, if I was an expert on it, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that I still am. Um, I'm aware of um, a, f a fair amount, and I've certainly got my theories. But um, you know, I would actually have to go back and look at what um, what I covered in the beginning. But I think what I can say is the fact that the, the some DNA was found on the inside of John Bernays. Um, clothing is credible in the sense that you can say well that's that was very likely unlikely to be contaminated in other words if John Bonet was carried from the basement to the lounge and she was contaminated when she was put down kind of in the hallway and then picked up and put down in the lounge on the carpet where there would have been a lot of DNA and of course all the other people were there, the Fernies, the Steins, you know, and, um, you know, are you going to, you know, and, and then also the, the um, I think the rug was thrown over as well, um, you know, so, so th but that's all kind of maybe going to contaminate with, um, on the outside. So, it's, so on the inside, it's kind of a different story. So I do think the, the DNA, that DNA aspect is credible. But if you actually had a court case, 
I don't think either side would really be able to go anywhere with it. Either side would be able to dismiss evidence and argue evidence. I don't think it would really go anywhere. That's why it's not a DNA case. Um, and then there was also DNA, DNA under John Bonet's fingernails. But the point that I want to make about this, I don't really want to make this the focus of this episode, but what I do want to say is that um, I wonder if I should say this. Let me just say that the claim that the DNA testing exonerates the Ramsey family, um, I don't think is necessarily true. Um, I understand how they're making it, but I also think it's not entirely accurate to say that. Uh, I think it exonerates John and Patsy, uh, or it might exonerate them, um, although there are things like fibers under the um, uh, duct tape. Uh, and so in that sense, you're saying, well, the DNA is not there, but the fibers are there, so how can you be exonerated? But just in a purely DNA sense, um, I don't think that this claim is, is actually um, correct for a couple of reasons. Um, and then the other side of it is the claim that the DNA came from some kind of factory worker in wherever, Malaysia, wherever uh, you know th th this was packaged. Um, I don't believe that's true. I don't think it came from Malaysia. I think it came from Boulder. But um, yeah, I'm not going to, it's, this is quite a sensitive subject. Um, and I'm not going to talk about it any further here. But uh, it, it does, it does, um, it does cut kind of to the heart of the case. So, um, so, so what I think Lynn Wood is actually doing here, you know, by kind of saying, well, what the grand jury said is a snippet, and but our evidence is actually credible. So, you know, so, um, you know, the DNA says unambiguously there's a, an intruder, right? And this is how you turn five golden rings into five running hairs. This is literally how you recast the Ramsey did it narrative to the intruder narrative. You say this DNA story, this, this DNA anecdote, this thing that I'm saying about the DNA, when you use that as a kind of incantation, you can just say DNA and then wave your magic wand and suddenly you have the intruder narrative. Suddenly um, an intruder did write the ransom note. Um, an, an intruder did break in but forget to assault, sexually assault John Bonet. An intruder did write the ransom note and forget to collect the ransom. So that that's literally how you have this kind of conjuring going on. And so this brings us to the 750 million lawsuit that's referenced in the title of this episode and you know we kind of know what happens uh, CBS got the experts together and they presented their scenario which is kind of a pricey you know summary of Kola's book and you know they presented kind of an interesting scenario but it certainly wasn't the intruder scenario and in this scenario, um, they kind of provided a version where that focused on Burke Ramsey. And um, there were some interesting aspects that some people either didn't know about or had perhaps forgotten about, but there was 
discussion about um, could Burke be heard on the phone? You know, w was John saying to Burke, "We're not talking to you." Was was um, was Burke saying in res you know kind of in response? What did you find? And Patsy saying, "Help me, Jesus!" And you know, it sounds like John saying, "We are not speaking to you." And uh, you know, there some people who speculate that this call was made in the basement, and because there is a basement phone there, um, John Bonet's body was found in the basement when. The Ramsey sued CBS. One of their complaints was that this information wasn't new. Basically, it had come out before quite a long time ago. I think it was even in Steve Thomas's book. Um, you know this this allegation. So I think the accusation from Team Ramsey was basically just, you know, you've said this is a new investigation, but it's not. You know, you you're just bringing back old information that's kind of discredited that was kind of the the org one of the arguments then there was also um, additional analysis of Burke's interviews and and other things which I'm not going to go into here but the result of it was because CBS kind of pointed the finger at Burke um, both John and Burke sued CBS for 750 million rand um, dollars 750 million dollars in a class action suit against many of the um, participants Jim Clementi uh, Laura Richards you know pretty much all the folks involved and you know the crazy part is you have this huge lawsuit just almost like the grand jury trial as well you, you have this huge thing going on um, and then what happens nothing there's like just no result just right nothing happens grand jury trial um, everyone is you know talking and pitching up and this and that and testifying and then what happens nothing just like unresolved and this is the same you've got this huge law so it's not just 10 million again it's you know it's just a ridiculous amount and then what happens nothing and you would think that if the the Ramses had won that lawsuit that they would be telling everyone about it they'd be saying we won and CBS gave us all this money and let this be a lesson to all all other whatever's you know people wanting to make documentaries but certainly the the lawsuit has calmed things down there haven't really been documentaries since have there And I still think it's very significant that, you know, the fact that the grand jury did vote to indict the Ramses, and yet so many people for so many years were, especially in Team Ramsey, were, you know, kind of adamant that, yes, they won, that kind of won the case, that they, they weren't guilty, they were innocent, they were found innocent, and there you go. And that's never the, that was never the case. They were never um, found in terms of the grand jury trial um, innocent and the exoneration needs to be in inverted commas because it was sort of based around um, Mary Lacey and when she extended clemency to the Ramses it upset a lot of people Mary Lacey was also a big proponent of the whole John Mark Carr thing and then it turned out he wasn't even in Boulder when the crime happened so anyway um, it some people would say that it was a mistake from Mary Lacey to um, publicly exonerate and even apologize to the Ramses 
But once again, what we're talking about with something like that, this time from, you know, Alex Hunter's replacement, we're talking about a district attorney who is turning five golden rings into five running hairs. It's literally her deciding that the intruder narrative is what they're going to run with. And so they did. And so I want to come back to that whole days of Christmas motif, right? And what I've been able to find is around about a dozen different, even more than that, um, about 22 different versions of the 12 days of Christmas songs, right? And these ver versions come from um, seven, as far back as 1780 um, and then through the 1800s, 1840, 1846, 1855, 1864, 1867 and then the, the 20th century, 1917 um, uh, and, and then it, I, I think that the last kind of update was in 1966 and, and th that was pretty much the way that it, it kind of stayed and when you look at these 22 different versions um, all of them s basically stick to, to you know my true love sent to me or my true love gave to me Almost all of them have a partridge in a pear tree, turtle doves, French hens, calling birds, golden rings, geese are laying, swans are swimming, right? But as soon as you go from that point onwards, when you go to day kind of 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, then there's a heck of a lot of discrepancy. I, I'm not quite sure why it creeps in at, at that point, but, you know, some accounts have, and this is for day eight, eight maids are milking, or eight ladies dancing, or eight hares are running. In some cases, it, it was forgotten um, in, in the, the Kettridge version of the song. But the point that I'm trying to get to here, there's another one, eight hounds are running, eight boys are singing. The point is that it's, again, a very, very... Um, sort of big difference that's going on you know it's now lots of differences creeping in um, there's a little bit of similarity between maids are milking and ladies dancing but you know it's ladies but not much beyond that you know it's not very similar you can't really argue that maids are milking and hares are, are running have got any sort of thing and then when you go to the, t the ninth day th then it's um, nine drummers drumming and in some songs nine lords are leaping and in others it's nine ladies dancing so uh, even nine lambs are bleating nine bulls are roaring nine pipers play playing nine bears are beating nine you know so it goes on and what this is just showing is how at this point in the song it's sort of um, very inconsistent. Something's happened where at this point it's it's sort of each each kind of song for oneself kind of thing. And kind of what I mean is, you know, as soon as you have that inflection going from the intruder theory um, you know, where, you, where you're saying, okay, well the ransom note's written by an intruder or whatever then you have a situation where now anything is possible. Now it can be any, it can be theoretically be anyone in the world besides the Ramses. And in a way you can say, well, this unknown DNA evidence um, could be anyone, and, and, and that's, but that's the proof that it's some other person. I don't like the way that the DNA evidence is sort of fielded. It's sort of fielded as um one profile and I don't believe it is I believe it's two profiles 
and if you want to have a profile that no one will ever find then put a, a profile that's two people in to a system and you're never ever gonna going to find someone like that because they don't exist literally they don't exist of course if you sequestrate the profiles then you're going to get um, you know potentially two two people um, you kind of have a similar situation in the McCann case where they found DNA in the um, Renault Scenic um, apparently from um, you know just cadaver traces and then they couldn't sort of fully sequestrate that information with the technology they had at the time. They can now. And I think it's a similar thing. The, the McCanns have also turned the whole um, disappearance of their daughter into a disappearance and not death using DNA, saying the fact that DNA was found doesn't prove that she that it was uh, Madeline, blah 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 blah. In other words, the DNA is being used kind of as a key to open a door that actually doesn't exist. But you are now conjuring a new reality, and from there, all sorts of little stories and anecdotes and lyrics can kind of be possible. You follow what I'm saying? And when you go to these other versions, you know, it, it, it talks about, you know, instead of 12, um, drummers drumming, is 12 bells are ringing, instead of 11 pipers piping, there are 11 ladies spinning, now what is it, is, is it are they on spin bikes or they're spinning yarns and so you can sort of go on and just say what I'm saying is it's it's in this area where you've now conjured a reality based on nothing you just turn the DNA key now suddenly everything you know now gets thrown out the window now it could be anything and that's that's how you exonerate somebody or you try to and so what's what I want to compare for you guys in this respect is if you look at the different versions of just the song and as I said really towards the latter end you know as you go closer to the 12 days of Christmas the 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 days that's where it starts to fall apart the, the, the beginning is quite cohesive the, the lyrics are, are similar but as it goes further on they they're very um, they're very different and if you go to the next slide here you see all the books written about the Ramsey case and they are not only are the books different from one another but they, they are different theories that are totally different to each other there's intruder did it um, a strange intruder did it a um, familiar intruder someone known to the family did it the Ramses did it, Patsy did it, John did it, Burke did it, and so on. And um, my book's one of those reference in that sort of cloud, that hazy cloud of, of script that you see there. And But this is the point. If something in there is true, if something in there is kind of the breakthrough game changer facts about this case, Good luck finding it in that in that haystack, right? What the McCanns and also the Ramses have succeeded in doing is creating such a confusing maelstrom of information, just an incredible mess of information that it's very hard for anybody just to sort of walk into the case and be like, okay, that's what happened, because there's it's so disorienting because there's so much to find out and figure out, right? And um, that that requires kind of true crime rocket science. It really does require someone to that, that has the time, that has the intelligence, that has the capacity to um, you know navigate through this sort of dust bowl to the, the the truth. And you know, if you take something like you know seven swans are swimming, 
if that's the the lyric of the crime then then someone has to come up with the true crime rocket science version of that lyric it's not exactly the same lyric but it is approximately the same it's not distorting it making blackbirds into mockingbirds or something like that it's still swans are swimming but maybe there's just a little bit of a slight difference in the coloring and that's what true crime rocket science um, needs to do and does do and has done in this particular case and so things like that 750 million lawsuit what they achieve are stopping people from talking openly and even in this particular episode I'm not saying things that I would like to say uh, just because one needs to be careful and that just shows how it's it's successful you know the all those many lawsuits that I mentioned earlier it if you say a certain thing and we all know what it is then you can be in serious trouble and but there is a way around that it, you know you can defame someone by kind of pointing your finger and saying this person definitely did that I know that for a fact blah 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 but there's another way you can make the same kind of claim in an indirect way you, you're stating something similar but kind of a, in an indirect way and what I mean is you sort of make the argument where you say um, you you say well what about this theory I got that doesn't work what about that that doesn't work and then you exclude possibilities and then you kind of leave it to the viewer to say well you know we've looked at all the possibilities what what is likely given what we've looked at and then it's just a question of logic it's just a question of what is what is what does it point to okay and so that brings us to the, the final part in this episode which is what I covered in Christmas Star which is the significance of the last photo and I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail but it basically boils down to this bow that is in John Bonet's hair and it is the same bow that you see when John Bonet is deceased on the floor and it raises kind of two very basic questions the one question is did she go to sleep you know would she have gone to sleep with a bow in her hair and you kind of have this version where um, John and Patsy say that John Bonet was extremely tired that night and then she you know um, they tucked her into bed and, and, and changed her well the fact that this bow is still in her hair seems to indicate otherwise I'm not saying this is a fact and people have um, gotten very petty on some forum saying how dare you say that or whatever um, do you know because of the nature of this case you've got to be very careful with what you say how you say it and it's an unsolved case and so one does have to uh, speculate in some areas and you've got to be clear that you are speculating just as CBS did where they said there are a number of possible theories and so when you say it appears this way you need to do that to protect yourself wake up so this cloth in her hair is basically suggesting that John Bonet didn't go to sleep and that's something I went into in Christmas Star is just the sleeping habits of John Bonet she wasn't a uh, a happy camper she wasn't sleeping very well um, she would often sort of stay up watching television and she wanted to sleep in a room with a television because she couldn't sleep and it was complicated by her wetting the bed chronic bedwetting and it wasn't just her with that problem just Burke as well 
So the whole idea of the uh, thing in her hair supports the notion that John Bonet was possibly neglected, that she just wasn't put to bed, and she. Um, kind of had to put herself to bed. That's what it suggests. In exactly the same way that the pineapple found in her, her stomach also suggests that John Bonet didn't go to bed and that she was wandering around the house and eating. That's not, you know, that's also speculation, but it's speculation based on evidence. Speculation based on, you know, the photos of the pineapple, you know, all the stuff that we've gone through. But what's happening now is this um, this cloth in John Bonet's is reinforcing that idea. It may not be true, but it 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 is starting to reinforce this idea that she didn't go to bed. If she didn't go to bed, what was she doing? Who was she doing it with, and where? So that's the one aspect of the cloth is to do with. Um, her not sleeping and the other aspect is to do with neglect if she wasn't put to bed if this cloth wasn't removed from her hair if she, she you know, wasn't changed in the way that she was said then that doesn't that line up with the, the actual charge that came up at the end which was um, allowing John Bonet to be unreasonably placed in a situation which posed a threat of injury to her or her health which resulted in her death. So imagine you've got a child who's not sleeping very well and you don't put that child to bed and maybe there have been other incidents and now she's in a situation that poses a risk to her. That's what they were ultimately charged with. Eh? That, that is what they were accused of by the grand jury. And so the fact that this last photo is kind of pointing in that general direction, that you know she may have not gone to bed, and if she did go to bed, someone didn't take that out of her hair. It 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 looks like someone being reckless, doesn't it? And sure, you can argue not necessarily, but that's not what the grand jury found or what they argued. They argued that it was someone placing John Bonnet unreasonably in a particular situation. Now, now, what does that mean? It did mean something specific. What do you think it meant? What are the obvious ways that you take care of a child or don't take care of a child? I mean, wh one of the obvious ways is you um, teach them not to wet their beds. Another obvious way is you make sure they go to bed, right? Another obvious way is you look after them just in terms of their health. You, you, allow, you, you make sure that they're washed and cleaned and don't get sick. You love them and you care for them and you pay attention to them. And the opposite of that is not knowing what they're doing or knowing what they're doing and knowing that it... Anyway, I think you know where I'm going. So, yeah, I cover some of these ideas in Christmas Star. Um, you can go and check it out. Um, much better than I am here. I, I'm not referring to... Uh, what the housekeeper said um, about um, how the children were raised and you know what um, John Ramsey, Patsy and Burke said about what is going on behind closed doors. I'm not referring to any of that here and it is important to refer to it because you're getting it from them. You're getting it from um, you know ground zero essentially of kind of what happened here and th that that's the way to make your case not, not by just sort of waffling on without um, detailed references and that's the difference between a YouTube video and a book so so I advise you to go and check that out um, and that that basically concludes um, this episode in the series I hope you've enjoyed it 
Um, from here, um, we are going to well, two gram rocket science is going to be dealing with the debunking of that podcast series about the final suspects. Um, and that will be on Patreon and then there are a couple of other episodes to look forward to on Patreon like the Atkinson transcripts we're already up to episode 5 in the 15 part series I'll also be doing a episode on the murder weapon revealed in uh, on Patreon and then um, just kind of debunking some of the obvious sort of myths ar around this case and then also dealing with uh, why the mainstream narrative is full of crap uh, you know what is wrong with the way that that it's thought out so one obvious answer is that the crime didn't happen in the kitchen it wasn't a, a random spontaneous act which they actually say in CBS that that it happened by accident um, that that's not what the grand jury thought the grand jury thought um, you know they were that the Ramses were accessories to first-degree murder not first-degree accident so that's something I'll also be looking at why the mainstream theory is full of crap and there are quite a few reasons for that it's the same reason why a lot of people who think they know this case very very well um, they're also full of crap um, they have been stuck on their thinking for a really long time and um, probably just so focused on little details that they can't actually see criminal psychology that they, they, they don't think that way they think about you know is something A or B and, and that's what all, all they're capable of thinking of and so yeah in another episode I'm going to be just dealing with what to expect in the year ahead from true crime rocket science uh, I'll just be going through kind of an infographic just of what is um, on the table this year so it should be quite interesting um, but uh, yeah I think that's it for now uh, thanks a lot for being here thank you for listening um, but uh, what I can say about 2020 um, like I said I'll go into it in a lot more detail but um, I'll be appearing in a documentary called Bloody Valentine uh, dealing with Oscar Pistorius um, and 2020 is the year that I will finally reach a milestone I've been angling towards for some time which is um, 100 books I'm four books away from 100 and um, so I'll be talking a little bit about the last four books that I'm going to be writing it's not going to be the last four books ever but certainly after I've reached 100 books I'm going to be transitioning to more um, you know content kind of on the ground and so on and, and that's also going to be quite exciting um, I should also let you guys know that I'm going to be favoring the Patreon channel kind of from now on. Um, I will be doing just comparatively slightly fewer videos on YouTube. Um, it will probably be something like uh, two to three a week compared to the five or six or seven that, that I've been doing lately. Um, so it will be two, two or three a week and then um, about four or five on Patreon so I'll basically be doing around about double um, uh, on Patreon and which is another way of saying I'll probably be doing half to a third on YouTube um, I'm just finding it very hard to do both I'm finding it very hard to kind of serve two masters and um, it is very time consuming you know I'm one of the few creators that puts up images sources the images it means I've got to do a lot of um, kind of graphic design right and that also takes time 
Um, it takes time to source the images. It also takes a heck of a lot of time to sync them up to the audio. And I know a lot of people, um, you know, maybe just listen. But for me, it's important to to put them together. And so it's you know takes quite a lot of effort and it's quite time consuming. And you know, I I need to transition out of writing um, full time and. I need to find a way to, you know, still make a living by, you know, uh, talking about the narratives or whatever. I'm not going to stop writing books. I'll, I will continue writing books after 100. But uh, but where it was, you know, 16 books a year on average for six years, it, it will now be something like, um, you know, one book every three months or something. Having said that, um, I'm very open to producing kindlets which is what I believe what I um, think is kind of um, going to really be a, a good little product for true crime rocket science which is basically just um, a book that can be brought out very quickly um, half a week a week at the most and a book that is fairly short like 10 to 20 thousand words in fact, Christmas Star was meant to be a Kindle, but it, it ended up being 25,000 words. Um, to me, that's just outside the range of a Kindle. Um, 25,000 words is a fair amount of writing. It's about 100 pages. So, But that is something I'm thinking of doing a um, bit more, is writing much shorter books um, fairly frequently, and then the longer books um, less frequently so maybe every two months or three months I mean it's still a hectic way to to write and to earn a living but I'm up to it but I, I definitely need to bring the pace down so so um, that's kind of what's in store for 2020 there's actually a lot more to say but I'd rather put um, that in its own separate episode I'm really tired, so I hope it's not come through too much in my voice. Um, but um, yeah, I'm just really wasted. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you for listening. Um, I uh, appreciate you guys being here. Um, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. Let's try and get to 10,000 subscribers. Um, and uh, I'll see you guys next time.